if for some reason I did say, hey, go back, go back, go back, and they turned and went back and they drowned, who's liable for that? Me. And if, I, if they do make it all the way back, well, then what did I do? I allowed them to break the law and then escape. That's an FBI investigation. Are you in cahoots with them? Is that family? Is that friends? You see what I'm saying? So this becomes a very strange space that most people don't talk about. As a board trader, I can stand and say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Stop, stop. And if they still do it, fuck. All right, you're under arrest. You've entered into America illegally. And read your rights, check their pockets, make sure everything's safe, take them into the station and process. I think a lot of America thinks that we should be pushing them back with shields, Let's get back. Um, but that's not the nature of the job. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually, you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents in Ironclad Original, presented by Montana Knife Company. For the first time today, we have a repeat guest. His name is Vincent Vargas. Sometimes he goes by Rocco. And today we are going to be talking about the border. Some people would call it a crisis. Um, other people would call it an emerging situation. Everything in between the two. Most people have no direct experience with the border, though, and they only have access to the information presented to them. Vincent is on the other side of that. So a little bit of information about him. He's a Hollywood actor, a producer, and he's a former Army Ranger and a former member of Star, which is the Border Patrol Search, Trauma, and Rescue Organization. He is also the author of Borderline, Defending the Home Front, now the host of a brand new Ironclad original podcast called Borderline, which you can find on Ironclad's YouTube channel at This Is Ironclad or wherever you get your podcasts. A few stats about the border that we covered in the episode. In the month of December in 2023, there was a 31% increase over the previous month of people arrested, passed, or made it through the border illegally. 250,000, just short of one quarter million individuals. While Mexicans accounted for more than 50,000 of those arrests, the most from any single country, nearly 47,000 were from Venezuela. There was also a surge in the number of people arrested from Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, and the region continues to deal with gang violence, political instability, and issues related to the drug cartel. We're obviously diving into the 2024 election cycle. I think it's safe to say that immigration and immigration policy will be one of the top issues, if not the top issue. And it's anything other than simple. It is complex. And I find immense value being able to sit down and talk with people who have actually physically walked the ground, metaphorically and physically, who have interfaced with the policies, who have been responsible for executing the policies that they had no hand in setting. And with that, let's dive into it. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Dude, you're the first repeat guest, I think, on Change Agents. I'm pretty sure. Pretty cool. I think so. <laughs> it's not as cool as that TV you have, but I mean, that's a that's a subject for a different podcast. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to read you some stats because we're going to start talking about the border because we need to talk. For- we need to talk about the border. I'm going to read some stats and then we can just dig into this. So, I got okay. three. This past December, meaning 2023, border crossings reached an all time high, with the Border Patrol making. 249,785 arrests. I'm going to repeat that number for the listeners and watchers. 249,785 arrests. Now, that's for the month of December. That is not for the year 2023. And that is up 31% over the previous month alone. Second bullet point. While Mexicans accounted for more than 56,000 of those arrests, the most of any from any single country, nearly 47,000, were from Venezuela. 
There was also a surge in the number of people arrested from Guatemala, Honduras, and Colombia as the region continues to deal with gang violence, political instability, and issues related to drug cartels. Immigration remains a key issue in this election year, with ABC News reporting that it now ranks almost as important as the economy among voters. And I actually personally suspect that it will battle for the economy for the number one position in the upcoming election. Personal estimate based off of uh, no data whatsoever, but I bet you border policy and information around it will be the number one topic. So the first interview we had was a year ago. Just read off some stats that I hope blow people's hair back, or maybe eyebrows off a little bit. In the year since we've talked, how have things at the border changed? What have you seen change? It seems to have been a massive uptick. Um, I think the first time we talked was somewhere around the Title 42 change, uh, and that was that was implemented during the COVID time of how people were allowed in or who wasn't allowed in at the time because of COVID mm -hmm. and kind of the, the national security, but also the, the health uh, scares of, of bringing in COVID from other countries. Uh, when, it, when, when it changed back to the kind of the Title VIII, the 1325, uh, it's the basic what it was before now back implemented. Uh, there seems, seems to have been some kind of shift where we have an unprecedented amount of numbers coming through seeking asylum. And you've seen the numbers, you've read the numbers. A uh, majority of those are going to be coming through seeking asylum, uh, but not necessarily needing it, but almost coached into saying they're seeking asylum. And so they go through the asylum process. And it's been pretty insane to see. Is that just because the asylum process, is it because it has a higher likelihood of success? Or is it just the easier path, the path of least resistance when it comes to immigration versus asylum? It's not a path of least resistance, per se, in normal circumstances. Uh, it is just a path of bogging up our system, but as well as it is a path that legitimately is used for those who are seeking asylum from countries who are on the list that are allowed to seek asylum. Um, currently, our immigration system is a little overloaded. I say a little. It's just, uh, I mean, it's overloaded, and we don't have anything in place uh, other than doing the notice to appears because we don't have... There is nothing in our system that would house this many individuals until they see the immigration judge to make a determination of their case. So when someone seeks asylum, it is not for the Border Patrol, per se, to make a determination of that case, or ICE, or anyone else other than an immigration judge. They have the due process of seeing their file and understanding to they get a chance to see their argument and they determine whether it is a valid argument or not. And so that system is so overwhelmed right now. There is no other answer that we have currently in place besides allowing them to go into our country and show up at a later date. Assuming they choose to do so. Uh, I think the number is somewhere under 3%. Yeah, I think the last time we talked, you were telling me about the notice to appears were already pushed out into, I believe it was late 2025. Uh, 2030 now. 2030, 2030. Yeah. If not later, I think 2020, I think 2034 was told today by, by a sheriff who works on the border during a borderland podcast. We were talking, he was explaining that just the latest he's seen that blew me away. Well, that's a decade from the, uh, the day that we're sitting in right now. Yeah. I mean, that's just to show the numbers of that have massively influx into our country and just based on the system of when they assume an immigration judge will be able to get to their case. Yeah. Can you break down the differences between a legal immigration pathway versus the asylum pathway? Legal immigration is, is a longer, and it's something that I'm actually trying to learn more about myself but that process, you usually hire an immigration lawyer who helps you petition for why you want to come into this country legally. It could be for multiple different reasons. Say 
you know, you've been in this country for multiple times. You're proving to be good in status. You're holding a job. You're doing all the right things. Uh, it doesn't matter what country you come from. Uh, that takes a, a long period of time. It could take five years at minimum. I've heard from some people who in some cities who don't have a, a massive influx of immigration, but in some cities it's taking uh, 10, 12, 15 years. And so it varies based case by case scenario. But at any time, if those individuals say they have a hiccup, naturally, they, they get a DUI, well, then they, they're lost in the system. They no longer could attempt to try and come into this country legally. And so the legal process is pretty challenging, pretty expensive, time consuming, and it could take many years. So that for me is something that we should be looking at. And Why is it so difficult? Now, I mentioned, I think in our podcast that legally, I believe it was last year, we allowed 1.5 million people to enter this country through the proper channels, the proper process. And so that doesn't stop, right? We continue to allow legal immigration in this country. It's just, those are the, it's, it's almost a, a war of attrition. If you can endure it, the distance, the, if you can last the marathon, you'll get the opportunity. But it's pretty challenging and some people can't afford it. Um, and so that is the legal way of doing it. Now, if you're seeking asylum and it's a legitimate asylum case, uh, countries that, that are on that list fluctuate. They change from time to time depending on the government and so on and so forth, and threats, whatnot. Uh, and so those fluctuate, and, and if you have a legitimate case, well, then you get allowed into the system, into our country legally. We're legally permitting them to come into this country and they can, you know, get a job and so on and so forth. And they can start working towards becoming a naturalized citizen as well. They will now fall into the system of the naturalization process, which I said can take five, 10, whatever years. But they're through the system in a legal standing somehow we're forgetting the fact that they crossed over illegally when they're seeking asylum. There is a proper channel to do that. Um, but again, it's, it's such a massive influx right now. What you're seeing is people saying, I, I'm just doing it this way because I'm seeking it's credible fear. I'm fear for my life, fear for my country. I'm seeking asylum. And so, you know, us as Americans and the, the nation of America, right? We, 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 we find out if it's valid and then we do our best to accommodate that. So seeking asylum, the right way would be going to a port of entry and saying you're seeking asylum. That process still takes a long time. And sometimes they hold you in Mexico or wherever that, wherever that border is that you've entered or you're trying to cross. Uh, and they'll do the, due, the due diligence of doing that. But those who are coming over illegally currently and asking for asylum, uh, it has become such an overwhelming situation. Like I said, we have no system in place to manage it. How much of the influx that we are seeing would you estimate? Because I'm, I'm, this is I'm asking you for your personal opinion, so this would be a guess at best. Is due to the political uncertainty getting ready to happen in 2024, not knowing what the policy may be moving forward versus knowing what the policy is right now, and taking action on that versus waiting for what might be unknown. Uh, I've seen I've seen two parts. Like during the Title 42 is kind of a good indication of how the communication works during title 42, it was going to transition back to title eight. Right. And that's just two different policies. That's all that is for those who are kind of like, I don't want, I don't want to know all the legalities of it. Can you but explain two different policies 42 and eight though? Like broadly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so 42 was implemented during COVID. Uh, it was implemented by the, uh, disease control, right? Forget what the CDC, excuse me. And that was for for uh, for them. They were saying, "Hey, we need to implement this in the, in the event that we protect our our nation from other countries." And so, it was an agreement between us and Mexico that anyone trying to come across, we would just direct remove to Mexico, and Mexico will take on that. I'm not sure what happened. At some point, they started just giving them NTAs as well. Okay, so that's above my pay grade. That's something I don't I don't I can't find the answers for. Um, but it's above even the border patrol. This was, you know, months ago. So that was put in place by the CDC just to make sure that we're kind of protecting our, our country from COVID during that era. It continued on until just recently. I don't know what it was a year ago or something. They stopped it maybe less than a year ago. And it went back to Title Eight, which was the pre-existing title from before Title 42. And all that meant is now if you cross over illegally, you're breaking the law 
and whatever policy is in place at this time, you'll be held to that standard. Uh, most of the time before uh, for Title 42, it would be jail time. It would be uh, expedited removal, meaning just deport them immediately. It would be so on and so forth, different things. But what happened was it continued to be the NTA process. We continue to allow them in and then they're seeking asylum or whatnot and then boom, the process. And so it's really, really odd. But during that time, when I went down, I went down to Eagle Pass just on my own dime to go, I wanted to witness this for myself and really ask questions. And what I found was that, that the migrants who were trying to come to America had two different stories. One side of it was, hey, we want to get in here before Title 42 changes to Title 8 because Title 8, you're going to see jail time, right? Title 42, we're going to get a notice to appear. Then the other half said, no, we want to get here because when Title, title 8 comes, we're going to be, we're going to be uh, let in. And so it was two different stories that was being told or communicated. And I'm not sure which one they thought was true, but it was kind of half and half. They almost split down the middle. You know, at the time down in El Paso, there was probably 2,500 migrants just waiting. And they were just sitting there waiting. And what happened to the process, the Border Patrol decides to to kind of control that scenario. They, they slowly let, you know, 20, 50 at a time to go process. And as the time clicked to, to, to 12 o'clock, well, boom, Title Eight was back in play. They didn't change. We thought maybe they were going to rush the border, right? They, they, they want to get in before Title 42 ends. No, no, they didn't. They were just like, no, no, we're... They were almost anticipating Title Eight, and they want that process. So a little bit of miscommunication on their part, um, but part of it also shows how no one really knows. Down there, they're just kind of making a good educated guess on what's going to be the best for them. By chance, Title Eight and the policies that were in place, uh, it, it almost stayed the same. They were receiving an NTA uh, notice to appear. And so just because the massive influx of numbers and there's no – Nothing in our in our government currently to to house them, and like we don't you are you going to put them in prison? That's kind of a little heavy to put someone who's coming here for asylum. We don't have hotels to put them so they can sit and wait for two years, three years, four years, right? And so this, there is nothing in place for that. And what was in the past, say my time as as a border agent was 2009 to 2015 time frame. Uh, in the past, there was heavier repercussions for coming in illegally. You would see jail time and then it would mitigate people just coming across and high numbers because they like, well, I'm not going, I'm going to go to jail. Right. So there was a repercussion that intimidated the cartel and not that just trafficking organizations and illegals who just want to do it on their own. So there was a form of repercussion that intimidated them. So they would go to a different border. They'd go somewhere where they know, oh, you can make five attempts before they actually put you in jail. And so that's kind of how the border has worked for many years. People find where they can uh, shift and and find more lenient uh, positions on immigration on different borders in different states. And so, yeah, when Title 42 and Title, I noticed that they weren't really sure. So I think the massive influx is two parts. I think part of them think they need to get in before the potential change of a president. And the other part thinks, well, let's just get in now because this president's taking care of us. So I don't, you know, I think... Right now, it's really on the smuggling networks are just saying, hey, right now it's good. Keep going. And it'll continue to be like that until it's not favorable for them uh, financially, right, to be successful. And so it will continue to fluctuate no matter what throughout across the border until there's repercussions met. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor, for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Goat. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. 
What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. It's obviously a complicated issue, right? Like it's not a light switch. We're not going to flip a light switch and all the problems are going to be solved because there's, you know, one of the things I hate about this issue is that Border Patrol gets a shit rap because people think that it's Border Patrol policy. When you and I have talked extensively, it's more ICE policy and Border Patrol has a, they're a cog in the wheel that leads people, you know, they might encounter them, but a lot of the time it's medical aid or sometimes they are catching people, but they have a small role in the larger hand of the immigration policy of the United States. Actually, they have no role in the policy. They have the role in executing the policy that is handed down to them. Correct. Um, how out of control is the border issue right now? Because depending on where you get your information, <laughs> it's, dude, we're, we're totally fine. The border is secure versus... Uh, the other side of the aisle, which is largely this is cut down political political ideology. The other side of the aisle is um, we're basically being invaded by military age males and Red Dawn is coming to the street near you. Yeah. It, it's funny. <clears throat> I've noticed that like it's really a political spectrum, right? It's it's left and the right. They say one thing or the other. Um even from my time, it's it's the same it's been, but there is a massive, massive influx of bodies coming across. And so uh, you can't say it's secure. We can all agree that is not the case in the sense. So I guess it's really how you see what is secure. What do you consider secure? Uh, the same thing is happening on the border as for border agents, for ICE, for customs. That has always been. They apprehend anyone they find smuggling, uh, anyone crossing illegally, they apprehend them. Uh, and ICE does what they're supposed to do based on their policy that they have to follow. So that has not changed. So when people think like the Border Patrol is not doing their job, false. Border Patrol is doing their job. But they're doing their job, and what happens after they've done with their job is out of our hands, right? And I say ours in like out of the agent's hands. Um, same with ICE and same with so Customs. So what has been done is securing our border to our ability. It's continuing to happen. Right. The difference is when I was an agent, um, a lot of the time people would run from us and you'd have to gain chase. You'd have to you'd have to track them for 10 miles, 20 miles. You'd have a lot of bailouts and vehicles trying to get away. Now it's more conducive to them to just walk up and give up. And so the posturing on their end has changed dramatically because the repercussions of after apprehension has changed. And so when I say the Border Patrol continues to do its job. And I don't speak on the behalf of the Border Patrol, right? I don't speak on the behalf of anybody other than someone who's lived this job. They're continuing to do exactly what their mission is. The problem is after they've let go, that policies have changed, right? The way we've managed that has changed as a country, as a nation. And so it looks, the optics of it from everyone else looks and says, Oh, the border patrol's not doing a job. Like, actually, that's false. All those apprehensions are us, right? And I say us as in the border patrol. All those apprehensions are the border patrol. All the drug seizures are the border patrol. ICE and, and customs, they have their part in all of that, right? All that is still being done. But once you process and you do exactly what their job is, what happens after, it's completely out of our hands. It's out of all of those agencies' hands. And it comes down to who's in office and what they see for immigration, right? If they, this currently is the situation, uh, whether I feel strongly about it in either way, I'm just telling you this is the situation. And so when people say, is it secure? Yeah, it's still the same exact secure as it was 10 years ago. But what happens after is different, dramatically different. And it seems like the volume is increasing as well. Massively, right. Because what happens after yeah. Is massively different. Yeah. In your time either working for Border Patrol or just in, in the time since being proximal to what's going on there, have you ever seen border policy this polarized? 
No, you know, I would, so part of my military career is PSYOP, right? Psychological operations. Um, and I've since have viewed the world slightly different and seeing how people use messaging. Um, and this border topic has been used, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally as a polarizing topic, right? How do you, how do you get people invested in a topic? How do you kind of divide a country where you make it an emotional, uh, subject? And this subject has become emotional for people in the sense of, if you talk about human life, that's an emotional topic. If you talk about human safety, that's an emotional topic. And so most of us kind of fall in line with one of those is more important to us than the other, meaning I want my safety. That's just as important. Other people's lives. Well, I pick mine over them personally. That's yeah. how. So my personal security is more important. Others who are more humanitarian and, 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 and empathetic, they say, hey, I want to make sure their lives are safe. So then they lean more towards that. And so the subject I've mentioned multiple times, and in, in, in I think one of our interviews is like, it's kind of both the duality of it, right, of homeland security and immigration. And so right away, that's divisive. Right away, uh, people lean more towards one or the other how they view the world. And so when you lean towards one or the other, you already start feeling emotional towards this topic and you want to counter the other argument immediately. This is why this has been so polarizing. Trump made it polarizing because it's an aggressive posture he took on it. Cool, fine. Did I agree? I, I, I liked some of the policies, but Obama had stricter policies. He didn't make it so polarizing. It was almost kind of underneath. It was something that wasn't talked about much. It was just implemented. That dude was a savage. <laughs> Bro, he, was, he, he deported more people than any other president, right? But no one talks about that. He took he the drone make... program farther than any pre, uh, president had previously as well. He was right, so vaporizing That's what I'm people. saying. And, and the way that all went down was not a public mention. It wasn't a thing to gain notoriety. He just did his thing. And not saying good, bad, whatever. I'm saying the difference was he didn't create these topics to be polarizing. And so now that this subject, you're either pulled one direction or the other, depending on how you see the world and how you look at it for yourself. And now it's become the most polarizing topic that we have today. Yeah, I agree. And it's a lot less listening and more people shouting. And it's and it yeah. becomes it becomes incredibly difficult and I would dare say impossible to separate the fiction from the truth. Because it's I, it's it's like who do you listen to? I mean, you can go to right. major media outlets, and again, I have whatever. Get your news from wherever you want to get your news from. I have no desire to tell people um, what they should listen to and you know what they should believe. But you're looking at the same issue through different lenses, and neither side is telling a complete picture, or the or right. I would say the complete truth. Far from it, actually. They're saying, yeah, they're more using the narrative to favor their arguments. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's not fair journalism, right? That, that causes more havoc. It causes, we, we don't digest information well as a, as a country, but as, a, as, as humans who are access to so much information, we're doing a very bad job of disseminating what's good to, to retain and what's not. And so people are very emotional on this subject that immediately they shut off their ear to learn, to listen, and they immediately go into attack mode. And so this is a really challenging subject because, hey, if you say close the borders, well, now you're a Trumper. You're a MAGA, right? It's like should yeah. they start associating things that are not fair, right? Uh, they start saying the American flag is, is racist. Like all those things are just these guys are hijacking ideologies and bundling up into one thing, and that's unfair. This is why we, we've had so much division and arguments about this topic alone. And, and everyone, every every major network is using this topic to to get their clicks and likes because it's an Im important topic, but they're using their own personal narrative, which I find a little frustrating. You're, you're destroying uh, the country internally and mentally and emotionally by using a narrative instead of like, let's tell the truth and let's say how, this is a complicated subject. We know, very complicated, but there's more that we can talk about in a sense of hopefully educate and inform and have fair discourse so both sides of this political spectrum should hopefully meet somewhere in the middle of that. One would hope. <laughs> One would, <laughs> trying. I mean, Seriously. all we can do is at least try, right? Someone has to try. And I think that's what we're trying to do with these podcasts is, is try to at least have fair discourse. You know what I mean? And if you're 
the guy that shuts it off because we're not, you know, sp- spouting your narrative. Well, then that's someone that needs to look in the mirror and say, hey, why can't I just listen to someone else's opinion on this? Yeah. You know? I-, I like these podcasts, too, because you actually have experience with your own eyes on the border. I mean, you mentioned it earlier on. Um, Eagle Pass. I've heard that quite a bit in uh, relationship to the border. Is that a, like a contentious area along the border? You've mentioned it a few times as well. Why do you choose to go to Eagle Pass? What's going on there? One, that's my sector. That's where I was first a, okay. a Border Patrol agent, so I know a lot about it. Okay, that would make sense. Um, and I'm assuming the well, thing- No, but two, let me, I'll mention this too. Yeah. It's where all the political drama is happening currently right now. Right, what? that's where everyone's talking about Shelby Park, the Texas uh, National Guard, the okay. takeover of the park. Okay, so it's it's a hot point for a variety of reasons. It is, but it shouldn't be. It is for the media, but in reality, if the argument is about borders, if the argument is about immigration, then the argument should be about the point of access that allows the most immigration or illegal immigration. And if that's the real argument, not there. It's probably too strong. It's probably California somewhere. So that's the funny thing. It is taking the political spectrum. The eyes are there. Divert your eyes, people, right? Yeah. Because Governor Abbott and his choosing to, with Lone Star, right, and and to safeguard his border, uh, and then the conflict above, people say, oh, the border patrol and the, the standoff, false. Those are words that they're using to create emotions. All wrong. Psyop. They're trying to psyop everyone emotionally to get into this and say, hey, a civil war is happening. That's complete bullshit. That is all uh, fear mongering. That's all psyop. They're just trying to create more division. They're trying to create more drama. <clears throat> the truth is, along the border, there's certain areas that have more influx of immigration than others. Eagle Pass at one point had a lot. It got the attention of Governor Abbott. He put into place what he believes he should for his state. Okay. And in that in that sense, he to gain control or asked to use to control of the park. And so Border Patrol had no access to it. And so that created like, oh my God, this the world's against each other, right? This is so false. Now the media is jumping on board. Now the media is using that as a narrative. And the truth is, if the argument is about illegal immigration, then the argument should be where's the biggest point of access for illegal immigration? Not there. Yeah. But it's good for likes and shares. What is Operation Lone Star? I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you about it. Um, obviously, it is in Texas, or actually, maybe even a lot of people don't even know that it is in Texas, but if you could unpack it a little bit. Yeah, I don't know a lot about it. You know, I hear a lot about it. Uh, I know that Operation Lone Star, I believe, is focused on, is a National Guard focused mission towards the border uh, mission, but as well as protecting our nation. And so, uh, for the most part, a lot of the Operation Lone Star focuses on human trafficking uh, and, and drug smuggling and, and, Im- and legal immigration, but more so protecting our nation, the borders. Uh, they don't have access. They can't do immigration. They can't do uh, what, what Border Patrol ICE does, but they what they have done is implemented, uh, implemented different measures to try and deter uh, illegal immigration. They've put barbed wire. They've put buoys. They've put conics boxes. They've, you know, they've had uh, a lot more... Um, high point, high vis locations, which means putting your vehicle in an area where they see you. So hopefully that deters traffic. And so they're doing what they believe is, is right. You know, um, personally, it's hard to say whether I completely agree with it. I think in, in the sense, like I agree with the state of Texas can do those things in the end. Uh, the state of Texas, it's going to be a battle because the Supreme court will always side with the federal law enforcement is the only ones who can do federal law enforcement, right? And so yeah. they can't enforce federal law in that sense, especially with immigration. Um, but, you know, it's kind of also a kind of a political posturing in a sense. You know, that like I think Governor Abbott really believes that more should be done. And I think a lot of people can, can agree with him. And so Governor Abbott's doing exactly what he thinks he should do to protect his state. And he has that right to, you know, and I don't think it, it's not causing the tension that I think the media wants it to. Right. They want to stir the pot a little bit, uh, but it looks good. Right. It looks good in the news reports and it creates likes and shares. And so Operation Lone Star is a bunch of National Guard who are, are, are activated to the border to do the border mission and whatever Governor Abbott has in store for that to protect his own state. That's what it is. Um, again, the hard part about any other organization 
trying to do the border mission is that my fear is the posturing that they have, that they understand the border patrol posture is not an aggressive posture. It can get aggressive posture because that's the use of force continuum. If you elevate your, your, your right, if you elevate your posturing, then I have to elevate mine one more. Yeah. And that is how I protect myself as a law enforcement officer. That's how any law enforcement officer protects himself, but that's also ROEs in the military. And so not everyone understands our job is very different in a sense. It's kind of the, has a human touch to it where most of the time it's going to be, Hey, sir, can you help me? I want water thirsty. Haven't eaten seven days, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I get a little concerned that they don't understand that posture as a military personnel. We're trained in a certain demeanor, uh, you know, ask, tell, make (laughs) you right. Kind of thing. And so I get a little concerned that people don't know the posture, but there hasn't been a lot of news of any kind of aggressive nature by them, you know, by, by the, by the national guard. I know there was media talking about, you know, not letting uh, migrants in, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they chose to, to take a posture of standing there and not allowing anyone to cross through. And so that's going to be, people going to have their own opinions on that. You know, I have my opinion on that. I just personally think like they were doing what their orders were for them. And that's how they see the, the border. But this, this job is the job as a border patrol agent boots on ground is very complex and they wear a lot of hats. And so I always fear that not everyone fully understands the capacity of this job. So it's like this. If I was a border patrol agent standing on Shelby Park and illegal migrants are walking across, they're attempting to gain access into America and I'm standing on the edge, right? So the river is kind of the neutral territory. Once you start crossing more on our side, it's like, okay, okay, you're trying. Once you touch landfall, Okay, at that point, I can't tell you, hey, stop. You're going to get arrested. Go back. Because they've already broken a law. And so it's for me as an agent to arrest them Mm -hmm. and put them through the process. If for some reason I did say, hey, go back, go back, go back, and they turned and went back and they drowned, who's liable for that? Me. And if if they do make it all the way back, well, then what did I do? I allowed them to break the law and then escape. That's an FBI investigation. Are you in cahoots with them? Is that family? Is that friends? Do you see what I'm saying? So this becomes a very strange space that most people don't talk about. As a board agent, I can stand and say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Stop, stop. And if they still do it, fuck. All right, you're under arrest. You've entered into America illegally. And read your rights. Check their pockets, make sure everything is safe. Take them into the station and process. I think a lot of America thinks that we should be pushing them back with shields and skip back. Um, but that's not the nature of the job. Ladies and gentlemen, I am excited to announce that Ironclad is launching an all new Ironclad original, Borderland, with host Vincent Rocco Vargas. You probably recognize his name because he's been on the podcast twice. Vincent is a Hollywood actor, a former Army Ranger, and Border Patrol Special Operations veteran. He offers a distinctive viewpoint on border related issues as the grandson of a Mexican immigrant. Take a look at this teaser for the upcoming Ironclad original, Borderland. It's hitting all major platforms on February 22nd. On any given day, there can be more than 10,000 apprehensions on America's southern border. Some have crossed snake-infested jungles with their children on their backs to escape gang violence and to find a better life for their families in pursuit of the American dream. Some, well, we don't know where they're coming from or what they want. My name is Vincent Rocco Vargas. I'm a United States Army combat veteran and a former member of Border Patrol's Search, Trauma, and Rescue Unit. On the new Ironclad original, Borderland. Each week, I talk to people to better understand the causes and effects of the border crisis. We cut through the partisan talking points. We're not interested in perpetuating fear. We're interested in seeking truth, hearing what's really going on on America's borderland. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. It's tough. Like, it's been an undertaking from all hell to try and sit in this position to write this book to try and express this to people because this is like one of the hardest topics of our time, but even more so now because it's become a divisive topic. It is like a challenge and I've, I've, I've lost followers. I don't give a shit, but I'm saying I've seen people just not want to even take the chance of 
reading the book because they believe it's a conservative narrative. I'm like, what the fuck are you talk about? Like, just read it, right? And that's the hardest thing. And the hardest thing about it is taking the position that I've taken, like, hey, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna just be a spokesman for it. I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna be vocal about it. I'm gonna try and express this in a way that that hopefully brings more people together, more people to understand it. Uh, but then turn around has made me a target for people with death threats and call me. I mean, the names they call me are like crazy. Uncle Juan, like an Uncle Tom, but a Hispanic version, right? <laughs> I thought it's funny, but I mean, I shouldn't be but, laughing at that, but it's, I mean, it's like, God, right, we are right. idiots as a species. The, uh, yeah. Derogatory <laughs> terms, the pocho, coconut, all these things that are just like, I don't get why we can't have fair discourse on a topic that is sensitive and actually have uh, like, I'm someone who's super level headed about this. I'm not emotionally invested into the fact because I don't bring emotions into, to, to this conversation. Cause I think it's the only way we can do it is, is just have, have a, have a talk. But the talk with me and you, these are two individuals who want to have, want to get an understanding, who want to ask these questions, who want to hear the other person's opinion. This is rare. This is rare as fuck, bro. And so that's why this subject will continue to be uh, used to argue, to to bicker. It's the weirdest. It's the weirdest thing ever, dude. Yeah. And you know, in the past, I'm writing another book, right? And in this book, I have several books planned, but one of these books. I put myself out there by writing this book, being Hispanic, being that my grandmother came here illegally. I voiced it in the book like, I'm going to tell you straight up, this is what happens, right? Which also gives me a different perspective of most, right? I am Hispanic. I'm half Puerto Rican, half Mexican. Um, and so I see this in, with empathetic eyes because I, I know what my family's done, right? With that being said is I assimilated to be to America because my parents wanted us to assimilate to America. We, they wanted us to speak English first. They yep. wanted us to, to get friends and grow and find success in this nation. My father served the military. My grandfather served the military. My uncles did. So they've all continued to invest into the nation of it, right? To this ideology. Um, and in that sense, there's a lot of Hispanics that struggle with how far can you assimilate into America without losing your roots? And I try to explain, I was like, as much as you want. That's the freedom of America. You want to assimilate fully and, and, and not have an accent. That's your choice. If you want to keep your accent, you want to hold on to your roots. You want to, that's your choice. Like that's the cool thing about this America thing, right? Is that you have that freedom of assimilate as much as you feel comfortable and to where you feel like you're not losing your roots. And if you want to lose your roots, that's fine too. But in that same sentence, a lot of people have trouble grasping that and feel they, they look at their own position and they want to project that onto other Hispanics, other Latinos and say, mm, I don't know, you're now more white than you are Hispanic, so you're, you're a white boy. And you're like, but why do that? Why do you want to project that onto me? It doesn't matter. I'm Hispanic. I'm a Hispanic man who's pretty successful and other Hispanics should be able to look and say, hey, I want to kind of follow his path or not follow someone else's. It doesn't matter. But the point is we tend to eat our own more in this, in this culture, in my race, we tend to eat our own because all of us struggling with what is proper assimilation in America. I've read about seven books recently from very successful Hispanics. And only one of them wasn't this aggressive tone towards America. It was a, it was a very, we, all of them, I mean, high level, high level education, high level education. I'm talking Yale, Harvard, Berkeley. And all of them have an aggressive tone towards America. But they failed to remember and realize that they still were afforded the opportunity to get a Yale, Harvard, Berkeley degree. That I don't have that opportunity. I fucking would find it. My kids will never be able to afford that. Okay? And so the fact that someone who was first generation or undocumented was able to gain that access, there's got to be a little bit of gratitude back to this nation that gives them that. Because no other country that they came from or their, or their generation would give them the same opportunity. And so... It's been hard for me to sit here and want to see my own. And I don't really, I've never thought of being Latino in a sense of what it is now. I think I had to take the ownership of like, I am Latino. And I want young Latinos like my kids to say, I can do anything I want in this country because this country is like incredible. And I never had to take the position until now, until I wrote this book and I became a target of it. And then I'm like, okay, well, let me, let me own this for a second and say, I am Hispanic. And here's how I assimilate and here's how I... I see it for myself, but I also want others to understand, like, it's not a race for who's assimilated the most or the least. 
it's just you you take your your life and you you run with that as far and well as you want to and you identify however you want to but it's been a real struggle for a lot of hispanics in understanding what's american and what's not and feeling that the country is racist towards them and and that you know these these really interesting arguments and and i don't discredit them i don't live their life i can't sit here and say that's mm -hmm. not true like if you're living in, in, undocumented in america and you gain a gain a uh, degree from harvard and they felt like their whole life was they were running from the law well i was like well, yeah, because you're undocumented. And so, so by law, if you did get make a mistake, you would have got deported. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree if you've been in this country since you were four, two, three, right? But the point is, that's a valid feeling because you were undocumented in this country. And it's not a form of racism, but she felt it was in that author. And another author felt same. So they feel these really in, in, interesting pressures of being Hispanic, but I think what they don't realize is our own culture is is a big part of why we feel that way. Our own culture makes you feel. I don't speak fluent Spanish. I, I said it in my book. I don't, I'm not afraid. To, I don't hide it. But then you, that's how people come back and attack me. Like, oh, you don't, huh? Yeah, that's because you're a white boy. Like, okay. I can't hide the fact that I'm Hispanic in Mexico. There's no, there's no denying that. But I don't speak Spanish. Because when my parents raised me, that's what they chose. They thought would be best. So it's a really interesting time in America where I think Hispanics are struggling with understanding their, their ideologies with America, as well as how far they want to assimilate as American, and two, how they want to attack others who don't see the world as their own. It's a very interesting time. I don't think it's unique to the Hispanic culture, to be honest. I mean, we're having arguments in our society about what the word truth means, about what it means to be an American, what are American ideologies. I mean, I have no doubt that people have had experiences in their life, and I totally empathize with people when they say that they have been treated in a racist fashion. But does that mean that the United States, via its policies, are racist, or there's some racist fucking idiots in this country that don't represent the, you know what I mean, the larger, absolutely, substantially larger population that is in that way? Because I hate to tell you, for every ism out there, we're never going to be able to eradicate it. Like, we took the firepower of the world in the 40s and eradicated Nazism from Germany kind of, even though there's still Nazi groups inside of the United States. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mean that Nazism is flourishing. It means that there's some idiots out there that wrap themselves into an ideology that nobody else believes in and understands, but they're still out there. You know, it's yeah, uh, it's it's a tough one, man. It's I worry about this country. We can no longer even agree upon the definition of what I would consider to be relatively simple terms. Yeah, and in my conversation about being Hispanic, I guess it's more what's what I see from my eyes and yeah. my position, and you know, and and yeah, I know you know the black communities they they deal with the same thing, right? White communities deal with the same thing, Asian communities deal with the same thing, and so. But for me, in my perspective, I guess I've kind of been put into the position of sort of a voice, and being on a television show, all those things. That, so I get a lot of people address me as like, hey. Puro Latino, you know, like, boom. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm proud of being Hispanic, but my Hispanic might not be the same as their Hispanic and how I see the world, and that's okay. Totally. But a lot of people, and a lot of people don't understand that it's okay, and so it's an aggressive conversation sometimes because everybody wants to feel comfortable in their own skin, but I think a lot of us are feeling more alone in our own skin because people don't want to, I guess, accept you for who you are. It's a really wild time, bro. And social media doesn't make it any easier, and the left and the right narratives don't make it any easier. You know, like it's it's a, it's a really crazy time, man. One of the narratives that I hear is that the border right now is basically a what would be the right word? A super highway for terrorists working their way into the United States. And I've heard everything from Islamic extremists to a lot of Chinese uh, influx as well. Are you? With, with your integration and in, in what's going on in the border, are you sensing an uptick in that? And because, and the reason I ask is this, like if, if the volume is drastically increasing and a certain percentage of people, let's say 1% of people who are always going to try to be coming into the United States, and I'm making these numbers up for people listening just to, to highlight a point, if 1% of people are there with malicious intent and they want to get into the United States to either become part of a whatever sleeper cell organization or long-term subversion, if you multiply the number of people in total coming across the border by 10x, by 20x, by 30x, of course you're going to see more of those people, but not at a higher percentage point. You know what I mean? So I'm saying it's the same amount of percentage-wise 
it might manifest and look like there's more because more people are crossing. I am just worried, uh, not worried, but I'm wondering in the context you have on what's going on on the border right now, are they actually seeing an influx of those type of individuals or is it probably the same statistical amount just now multiplied by that greater volume? You know, it's, it's a fact. Um, the, the border patrol sectors alone use their social media to, to tell what their monthly or, or annually the numbers are. And you'll see sometimes they mention some of the other countries that would be potential threats to America, but also there's, there's people who just want to come to America. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there is a, you know, I think even my mentioned it during uh, one of the hearings is that there is a bigger influx of Chinese nationals coming to the country. There is Middle Eastern individuals coming to the country. Not saying they're all bad guys. Just saying there is. The number is growing from the exotic countries that we we would we would list and say, oh, those are different. You know, the the fear for me is more so. That's a the big ticket item to travel from other countries to America, and um, it's interesting, right? Uh, just the other day, you, you know, I scroll the social media for some of these independent reporters that have no other agenda other than to show the truth. And there's several really solid ones out there that I can find on social media, but you know, he'll go up to each one and kind of interview and say, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? And China, 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 uh, you know, like, and then you'll have, you know, Guatemala, you'll have, you know, El Salvador and then boom, uh, you know, Africa, Africa, Africa. <laughs> so uh, it is proven that those numbers are, are elevated, right? Some of these countries that can be of concern. Uh, there was a video of an individual that was, Potentially identified. I think it's a very strong. He was identified, but I I can't confirm that in any other sense of uh, what they put what they put on video. It looked very promising and, and very authentic of an individual who was arrested previously uh, due to terrorist threats and so and terrorist associations. And so yeah, there's a concern. You know, um, I've said before just the fact that you know I'm a a war dude you know, special ops kind of guy that that's done a lot of uh, objectives, missions, and, and seen the intel in the background and, and what, what connects from Iraq and Afghanistan and how that can associate to us in, in America. I know you've seen the same. It's like, oh, this guy has contacts in America. Interesting. Um, it's no different now that I, that we start to see this massive influx of these countries that uh, can be, uh, have outliers who want to see bad upon our nation. It should be a concern for everyone. How do you think the... Uh cartels view current u.s border policy are they just like popping bottle you know champagne bottle after champagne bottle or <laughs> yeah i think uh you know they've they found a way to make it a very lucrative business um and i don't think that's going to stop anytime soon uh you know it's funny before we built the wall you know coming into america wasn't as challenging uh and when we did build the wall we kind of made them a more successful business. We've given them the fuel they needed to say, hey, now that it's hard, come through us. Yeah, we'll we're help. the experts here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so because of building a more fortified border, we created you know, the revenue stream by proxy of giving the cartel another way to generate revenue by helping others cross illegally. And so kind of a, you know, an interesting... Uh, an interesting deal to talk about because it's a uh, you know you you provide one thing and it, and it creates a whole different thing for for the cartel side of things smuggling organizations it goes back to what you and i have been saying since the first time we sat down and talked that this is not a simple issue the complexity and the layers and the upstream effects and the cascading downstream effects and where the Border Patrol and ICE and the federal policy and where it all fits together and all of those things that happen, it is impossible to solve in a short form conversation, which leads me to what's over your left shoulder right now. I believe <laughs> you may actually be working on something, a resource that people could uh, actually go to to get more, more I'm going to use the term nuanced because uh, that's probably the most 
sophisticated word that I know, and I like the way that it sounds and rolls off the it's tongue. It's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it ties in perfectly. Tell me about what Borderline is, why you're doing it, and what you want to try to do with it. Because what I really want for people is to have more resources so that they can start to unpack these things for themselves. Yeah, you know, I wanted to create a place that that we had the conversation with many different viewpoints, not just, you know, left, not just right, but like everyone. So we've sought out to find every expert we could in their field from law enforcement to uh, lawyers to immigration judges. We're trying to lock a couple down um, from authors to entertainers to, to everyone who has an opinion on this subject that might be an expert in their field from advocates to activists. Uh, I think it's important for us to sit down and allow them to say their piece and, you know, I will, I will give my opinions on certain topics and hopefully we can have fair discourse. I really believe if we interview enough people with their opinions, I think in the end, we're going to find that we all kind of fall more in the middle of both of those arguments. And it's only with having fair discourse that you can have that. Uh, the immigration judge, uh, or excuse me, an immigration lawyer who, who has to see, you know, some of the most unfortunate things about the border, he has an opinion. And I want to hear what that opinion is. The activists, they have opinions. And I want to hear what that opinion is. The sheriffs, the, the agents, all of these individuals have opinions on what's going on, on the border. They have first-line knowledge and experience of their version or their piece of the pie of immigration, of the border, of the crisis. And I want to get down to interviewing every single one of them to hear their version so we can kind of all be able to have, be in a position to take on that information and then from there make our own educated decision. This isn't uh, a left or right narrative. This is giving everyone the platform and allowing me to interview them and ask these questions that might be challenging for them. It might be challenging for us. But at the end of the day, we should allow ourselves to take in this information and do what we want with it. I could not agree with you more that I think almost everybody lands in the middle of the polarized arguments. And I don't know why, but it's funny you bring that up today. I was just thinking about it. For whatever reason, I just... I logged on to, and I'm gonna. I'll put out two news sources, and I understand that there are many more, but they are very tied to both the left and the right. I logged on to Fox News and CNN on the online, and all I did was actually just kind of tally the positive versus negative stories, and it was like an eighty twenty. And then I started thinking about my own life. Are eighty percent of the interactions that I have negative? I'm like fuck no, they're not even close to that. So why are we bombarded with? vastly negative news from both sides, right? It's a different angle on the same story. Sorry about my dogs. Oh, no worries. Different angle, same story, but is it, are they trying to scare people? Is it fear-based? Are they trying to weaponize the information? And I find, again, just looking back at my own life, what I'm being told does not match what I'm seeing with my own eyes. And I think most people are in that situation, which is why I love the idea of what you're going to be doing. Allow these people to talk from their own experience. And I think what you're going to find is that almost nobody actually truly aligns with those outlying far extreme, not, I don't even want to say extreme, but the, the outlying narratives on both the left and the right that we are bombarded with. They are yeah. reflective of the minority, whereas the majority is in the middle of those two things, but they have less of a voice. And I, I still haven't been able to figure out why exactly. I don't think the answer is good. <laughs> you know, are they, are they trying to, <laughs> you know, it's like, why would they want to do that? Well, people become more susceptible when they're afraid, right? You can manipulate people and push people. They're distracting. Yep. Are they trying to do something behind the scenes? Here's a perfect example. The border patrol or the border bill that they were supposedly arguing over that has billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine. Like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> yeah, that's a... How can you say that you want to work on our border, but then when you slide in the Ukraine side, well, yeah. that's not a border issue anymore. That's a world issue, and you're just balling that into it. It's kind of not fair for the argument. How about it a bipartisan a single issue bill where none of this other... Right. Bull, you know what I mean? But they don't want to do that. And then, of course, I start thinking when I have too much time on my hands, well, why not? And none of the answers that I come up with are awesome for the future of this country. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And, you know, I think we, we sometimes people like me and you have to be the place that has these conversations for those who are really looking for someone they can trust and, and have, you know, that open mind of 
discussion because it's too easy to fall into someone who's emotionally and wants to use this to, to fear monger, to drive traffic, to gain likes and shares and monetize. Uh, I, it's, it, we have to have places that are almost the safe space of information. <laughs> yeah. I hate to call it that, but I think it's important to have because, you know, I think people like my mother deserve to have a place they don't feel like they're being pulled left to right and who's someone who's easily manipulated because the media for her used to be a, a place of truth. Yeah. Now it's a place of narrative and that's unfair. I totally agree, man. Well, I know you're uh, running short on time. Finish up with tell me about the book. Um, and where people can find yeah. it, and then I'll get you on with your day. You can find the book on Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble. You know, the book is about my story as a border patrol agent. Uh, I wanted to tell a story that that is the truth of what it was to be an agent uh, from 2009 to 2015, and some of the awesome uh, opportunities I had in the special operations. You know, I think this book could be one of the best recruiting tools for the border patrol, especially for you veterans or military members out there looking for what's next and what you can do to protect this nation on our own soil. I think, you know, this book is a, is a, is a, is a testament to how important the border patrol is for this nation uh, and how complex the job is. And so if you guys are just interested in learning more about the border, border patrol career field, uh, this book will give you everything you need to know. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Like I said at the beginning, it's not a simple issue. I would advocate as strongly as possible to reach out far and wide with your informational sources when it comes to this topic. Don't listen to any one person or any one media outlet. Talk to people. Go beyond your traditional media sources. It's complex, and I don't think it has an overnight solution. One of the outlets that you now have available is an ironclad original podcast called Borderland, hosted by today's guest, Vincent Vargas. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We're going to be back next week with an all-new guest. Today's episode of Change Agents is brought to you by the Navy SEAL Foundation. And they are special to me for obvious reasons. I have a genetic tie to them through my time in service, and I've actually worked with them on a variety of fundraising and charitable initiatives. Their entire mission is to provide critical support for warriors, veterans, and families of Naval Special Warfare. Fundraising is really hard. It's hard to ask people for money, especially if you are asking them for a check with nothing in return. Um, I wish I could say it would be as easy as pulling on somebody's heartstrings and they reach into their wallet and they give what they can. But oftentimes, people are hesitant to give unless they can see the tangible results of the money or they get something in return. So I'm about to offer you that opportunity. The Navy SEAL Foundation has just launched their winter apparel line and they have everything that you need to stay warm because we're in the winter. So what better than supporting a charity, but also getting something to keep you warm in return. So you can step up your style while you're showing your support. Each purchase directly contributes to honoring Naval Special Warfare and their families. You can visit shop.navysealfoundation.org to grab your gear now.